All right, how's everybody doing today? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of um, the African History Network show. And uh, we're broadcasting here live on um, our Facebook fan page. Okay, we're broadcasting here live. Let me check my audio levels. Should be broadcast on uh, Facebook also. Okay, I see us on Facebook. How's everybody doing on Facebook? On our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Okay, so two things I'm going to talk about today. And uh, we'll be doing another broadcast very soon in the next day or so as well. But uh, two things I want to talk about today. We, uh, I'm going to do a, a overview of a uh, online class that I teach uh, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. Uh, we'll talk about that today. And, but first, we're going to talk about uh, Andrew Jackson, slave owner, Indian killer and hero of Donald Trump. So um, I think it was yesterday, uh, Donald Trump did an interview with uh, Sirius XM, and he made some very disturbing comments about um, President Andrew Jackson, okay? And Andrew Jackson was a slave owner. When he died, he uh, owned uh, about, 100, about 150 slaves, I think it was, when he died in his lifetime. Um, uh, he owned uh, somewhere around 300 slaves um, in his lifetime, okay? And um, he was president from 1829 to 1837, all right? So uh, he was known as Old Hickory. Uh, that was a nickname for him, Old Hickory. And the uh, um, his movement was known as Jacks, uh, Jacksonian Democracy, Jacksonian Democracy. We, we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll do another presentation dealing with um jackson and uh the democrats things like this we'll do with some of that history also we'll do another presentation dealing with that but uh, i just want to give a brief overview uh dealing with andrew jackson so um this is a slave owner this is a guy who also signed the indian removal act of 1830 the indian removal act of 1830 okay and the indian removal act what it does is it pushes the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians. It pushes them off of their land in southeastern United States. Um, and it it's pushes them all out west, okay, on what's known as the Trail of Tears, the Trail of Tears, okay? And they go over a thousand miles into uh, Oklahoma. And because the U.S. wanted this land, uh, Alabama and the uh, uh, Carolina's other other land that they were on. They wanted this land for uh, to, to, for slavery to have uh, plant crops, to have slaves on things like this, right? So to take this land from them, push them out west. So is is Andrew Jackson who signs this Indian Removal Act? Okay, um, he's president from uh, eighteen twenty nine to uh, eighteen thirty seven, and he reportedly owned as many as three hundred uh, Africans in his lifetime. Um, he began with nine enslaved Africans, but expanded his plantation from under 600 acres to over 1,050 acres. Uh, in responding to a letter to his overseer, Egbert Harris, uh, who had written him about a runaway slave, Andrew Jackson wrote, quote, although you will find some Negroes at first hard to manage, still I hope you will be able to govern them without much difficulty. I have only to say, you know, my disposition and as far as uh, lenity uh, can be extended, L-E-N-I-T-Y, -E uh, to those unfortunate creatures, I wish you do so. Subordination must be obtained first and then good treatment. Subordination must be obtained first and then good treatment. So we're saying that the Negroes, the enslaved Africans have to be subordinate first, then you can treat them better. All right. Shout out to everybody watching us on Facebook Live. Malcolm Taylor, uh, Edward uh, J. Bolden, B.J. Adams, Rashid Akbar. How you all doing today? So Donald Trump in saying that 
uh, Andrew Jackson would have prevented the Civil War from happening. He had a big heart, all this stuff. It, it's just a total lack of understanding of history, total lack of understanding of history. First off, Andrew Jackson was a slave owner. He was a white supremacist. Uh, he, he thought uh, African people were inferior. And he was an Indian killer. OK, number two, Andrew Jackson dies 16 years before the Civil War starts. Right. So the Civil War starts in the spring of 1861. Andrew Jackson dies in 1845. OK, so uh, Donald Trump tweeted yesterday uh, in response to the criticism showing that he has no understanding of history. Um, he tweeted. Well, I think it was yesterday he tweeted or this morning. He said that uh, Andrew Jackson uh saw the civil war coming really what what are you citing that andrew jackson saw the civil war coming 16 years before it happened and andrew jackson would not have worked it out because andrew jackson didn't want to give up his slaves so what i mean what are you talking about just makes no sense so I, i'm just going to share some excerpts of a few articles with you then we're going to get into our second topic because i'm going to do an overview i'm going to do a free uh preview of uh an online class that i teach called how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. OK, um, so he, here's what uh, Trump said. And you can check out this article from The Washington Post. You know, we've posted some of the articles on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network about it. OK, um, here's uh, an article from The Washington Post from May 1st, 2017, called Trump's totally bizarre claim about avoiding the civil war trump's totally bizarre claim about avoiding the civil war he was interviewed by um sirius xm and uh, there was an interview um with uh washington washington examiners uh selena zito okay um and in the article it says um why couldn't we all just get along why couldn't we all just get along that's what president donald trump wants to know about the civil war okay in an interview with the washington examiner selena zito our president historian posits that the war might not have happened if only andrew jackson has still been around if only andrew jackson has still been around okay now personally i don't think donald trump knew that andrew jackson died 16 years before the civil war started i don't think he knew that andrew jackson died before the civil war started just like I don't think he knew Frederick Douglass died in 1895 when February 1st, he's sitting at the White House around some black Republicans. OK, and he's talking about Andrew, J uh, he's talking about Frederick Douglass. And he said Frederick Douglass is, is doing a great job and 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 uh, has, has done a great job and he's being recognized more and more. I don't think he knew Frederick Douglass died in 1895. OK, and I don't think Omarosa told him either. But this article goes on to say that um uh okay so the whole thing apparently could have been avoided the civil war if only we had a bona fide negotiator someone more up to the task than the low energy abe lincoln this is what this is what the article is saying okay this article is written by aaron blake for the washington post now in the serious xm uh uh interview donald trump said andrew jackson was a swashbuckler but when his wife died did you know he visited her grave every day? I visited her grave actually because I was in Tennessee. So he's a, 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 a Andrew Jackson was a slave owner from Tennessee. OK, slave owner for Tennessee president from um, 1829 to 1837. So Selena Zito says, OK, that's right. You were in Tennessee. Trump said, and it was amazing. The people of Tennessee are amazing people. They love Andrew Jackson. They love Andrew Jackson, in Tennessee. OK. Now, this was one of the Confederate states, Tennessee. This is one of the states of the Confederacy. This is why they love Andrew Jackson. OK, because and the and, and these are some people, a lot of people voted for Donald Trump. OK, because the, this is these are the states that succeeded from the Union during the Civil War because they wanted to keep slavery intact. OK, because it is important for people to understand the Civil War was not fought to free the slaves. The Civil War was fought to bring the South back into the Union, which was the economic engine of the of the U.S. This is where most of the plantations were. This is where the majority of the crops were grown, things like this. 
not just the crops, but the enslaved Africans, there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1865, from 1619 up until 1865. There are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts. And, and these skills, trades, and crafts are going to be used to uh, build the country. Okay. So uh, when, you, when you look at why the Civil War was fought, the Civil War was fought to bring the South back into the Union. The Emancipation Proclamation uh, was uh, uh, used as a tool to bring the South back into the Union. OK. And if you actually read it. OK. So 1863, January 1st, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. If you actually read it and you go to archives.gov, archives.gov. OK. Go to archives.gov and you can actually read the Emancipation Proclamation. It, it tells you that the that the slaves in the South were uh, the slaves in the states in rebellion were free but the slaves in the border states and still in the union they were still slaves okay and it also said that the the, the states that were in rebellion those that joined the confederacy it said that if they come back into the union that they could keep their slaves so west virginia and tennessee come back into the union during the civil war they're able to keep their slaves until the civil war ends the civil war was not fought to keep slavery in the, the, the civil war was not fought to end slavery it was fought to bring the south back into the union in the uh, uh, freeing the slaves was a consequence of it after as a last resort to bring the southern states back into the union and to take away their um their their power base their power base the the wealth of the south was largely invested in their African slaves, okay? Their enslaved African people. So when you have um, Donald Trump talking about this, he's showing he has no understanding of history, okay? And um, there's another article from the Atlantic.com, the Atlantic.com, called Why There Was a Civil War, Why There Was a Civil War, okay? Um, uh, you could check that out. Now, I deal with some of this. I teach an online class called uh, African, uh, called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, so this course currently meets on Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's an online course. It's live. Um, all the sessions are recorded. Uh, so anything you miss, you can go back and watch it over and over again. OK. And um, if you want to register for that course, we'll post the information here for you, you can register for that online course. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, because we get into a lot of this information. It's a 10 hour online courses. Uh, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As soon as you register, you'll be able to watch the first seven hours of class. It's already been recorded. Um, and we get into a lot of this information. We'll get into the Civil War, some things like this. OK, uh, on Facebook, Leslie, how you doing, Leslie? Uh, Helen said that was an error on my comment. OK, there was an error in your comment earlier. OK, didn't see your comment earlier, but it's all good. Now, everybody watching, share this uh, broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. For those uh, just tuning in, hey, I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. I own the uh, African History Network Facebook fan page. We're broadcasting on. We have 970,000 followers here. So we have thousands of people watch these broadcasts, you know, over the course of the day, et cetera, next day. Um, I'm the host of the African History Network show. So we're doing two things here in this broadcast. One, we're talking about Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, slave owner, white supremacist, Indian killer, hero of Donald Trump, another white supremacist. And um, we're also going to talk about shortly uh, an online course that I teach starting up next Monday, May 8th. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. OK. All right. So in this interview he did with uh, uh, Sirius XM and, and Washington Examiner, uh, Donald Trump said, I mean, had had Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, been a little later, been a little later. You wouldn't have had the Civil War. He was a very tough person. But he had a big heart. 
And he was really, now he may have a big heart for white people, but not for African people. No. And he was really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War. He said, quote, there's no reason for this, end quote. People don't realize, you know, the Civil War. If you think about it, why? People don't ask that question. But why was, uh, why was, but why was there the Civil War? Okay. Why did the Civil War happen? Why couldn't, or why could that one not have been worked out? OK, so one glaring issue, the article goes on to say now he clearly has no understanding of history. And let me just say this. Let me just say this. Donald Trump is the uh, epitome of white privilege. Donald Trump as president is the epitome of white privilege. Only an old ass white male who people think is wealthy could become president, not knowing a damn thing, not understanding history. OK, not understanding the unemployment rate. He clearly has no clue about the unemployment rate. There's six different unemployment rates. The one that you hear reported the first Friday of each month is the U3 unemployment rate. He doesn't know there's six different unemployment rates. He's clueless. OK, he's clueless on the way politics works. He's clueless on the way the legislation works. He had to pull the bill off of the House of Representatives floor for the uh, 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 for the Trump care health plan because he didn't have the votes, because they wanted to repeal it on the anniversary of um, uh, the Obamacare being signed into law. And the first rule of passing a bill is, you don't set a date to vote on a bill unless you know you have the required number of votes to pass the bill. He's stupid, he's stupid. And the only reason why all these white people voted for him, but because they voted for white supremacy, let's be clear. You could not have possibly thought that a guy filed bankruptcy six times, a guy who set up a fake uh, 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 university called Trump University, charging people up to thirty five thousand dollars to teach them nothing. OK, you, uh, 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 a guy who has most of his products made in foreign countries and he hasn't said anything about being bringing the production back here. You have Ivanka Trump, who just got three patents approved in China. Four hours later, she's sitting down talking to the, uh, the prime minister of China and the president of China. And then she's moving one of her plants from China to Ethiopia because she can pay them less in Ethiopia. And they have worse human rights uh, uh, laws in, in Ethiopia than in China. You can possibly think this guy was going to make America great again. No, you want to make America white again. And now your ass about to get screwed. Because if you look at the budget that he presented, if you look at the budget that he presented, you can tell, number one, he has no clue what he's doing. Number two, he doesn't care about the people who voted for him. OK, so now now, now all these white people that voted for him are about to get screwed and they're scared to death. And you should be because we tried to tell your stupid asses. Hashtag we tried to tell you black people tried to tell you you wanted to vote for white supremacy. OK, and this is what happens. And actually, there's an article from The Washington Post. And don't worry, we'll get to how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. We'll get to that in just a minute here. But um, that comes out of white supremacy as well, okay? And there's a relationship between Donald Trump and Richard Nixon. That's why we're talking about this at the same time. We're gonna get to that relationship, okay? We'll get to that, all right? Um, let me see if I have this other article here. Um, Cause this deals, well, I got so many articles. Uh, I had it. Let me see here. I think I have it here. Uh, here's another article people should check out. We just posted this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. We'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute, okay? Prospects for Black America about to get worse under Trump, report says. This, this article came out today, Washington Post. Prospects for Black America about to get worse under Trump, report says. Where are the Black people that told you don't vote in this past election? Where are the Black people that told you don't vote for Hillary Clinton? We're the rappers that said things can't get worse. What the hell? What the hell report are you reading saying that things couldn't get worse? What are you citing? Nobody said, wait a second, next president is going to appoint an attorney general. Attorney general is head, head of the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is over the Civil Rights Division. The Department of Justice does investigations to the patterns and practices of police departments. The Department of Justice uh, is, is involved in lawsuits against uh, voter suppression and voter ID laws. We're the rappers that told you don't vote. Where are they now? 
Where the so-called scholars who told you don't vote in the last election? Where are these Negroes now? Okay, read this article. Black Prospect. We, we posted on our fan page, the African History Network. Okay, Black Prospects for Black America about to get worse under Trump, report says. Now, this is not based upon barbershop talk. This is based upon the data. This is based upon analysis. Uh, hold on. I really want to find this article here. I may have to pull it up. I know I printed it. And uh, oh, here we go. This is it right here. Now, we'll post this article today on, on Facebook. We're going to post it on the thread of our, of our broadcast here also on Facebook. OK, now this is from the New York. This is from the Washington Post. April 17, 2017, last month. About two and a half weeks ago, racism motivated Trump voters more than authoritarianism. Racism motivated Trump voters more than authoritarianism. OK, and this read, read that article. This falls in line with studies that came out previously that we talked about how xenophobia and racial animus were the driving factors of people voting for Donald Trump. OK, and they, and they and this and I've said this for months. They voted for white supremacy. They they wanted what they thought was their country back, but they don't know that African people are indigenous to this land, and we were here before they came into existence. So, this is uh, so check out this article also. Racism motivated Trump voters more than authoritarianism. All right, um, but if we go back to this article here from the Washington Post. Trump totally Trump's totally bizarre claim about avoiding the Civil War. In the article, it says one glaring issue. President Andrew Jackson wasn't really angry about what was happening with the Civil War because he died more than a decade. He died in 1845 before the Civil War starts. Civil War starts in spring of 1861. He died 16 years before the Civil War starts. But an ignoramus like Donald Trump a totally unqualified white male to be president he's so stupid he doesn't know this and and the people who voted for him are so stupid they know less than he does this is why a lot of them a lot of his followers are flying the confederate battle flag and they think that's the confederate flag that's not even the confederate flag they have such a poor understanding of history because they're sitting up watching the Fox News Network all day, a white supremacist propaganda network. They don't know that there were three flags that flew over the Confederate States of America from 1861 to 1865. And that flag that they think is the Confederate battle flag, the flag that was on the side and the top of the General Lee, that flag was never one of the flags that flew over the Confederate States of America. Not at all. That was the that was the battle flag of General Robert E. Lee's troops in Northern Virginia and some other troops in the Civil War. But that was never the the Confederate flag. That flag never flew over the Confederate States of America. That flag became popular once again because see Robert Robert E. Lee said at the end of the Civil War, he said that they need to fold that flag up, put it away and never bring it out again. OK. But what happened was in 1948, when you had the Dixie Crap Party and you have, I think it was Strom Thurmond running for um, running for president then. OK, with the Dixie Crap Party, they bring they bring that flag back out, the Confederate battle flag. OK. And um, then it becomes during the civil rights of uh, time, in like 61, when you have a, a, a push for civil rights, it becomes a symbol of opposition to civil rights. OK, this is this is how it became popular again. But uh, these people who are flying the flag and have it on their pickup trucks and things like that, they don't even understand this history. OK. All right. So. Um, let's go back here. Check out this article from history.com, history.com, official website of the History Channel. American Civil War history, American Civil War history, get some background history on the Civil War. We do a lot of this in my class, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with a lot of this in the course. It's a 10 hour course online. We posted the link there. 
If you need me to post a link again so you can get more information and register for the class, you can do that. Class is only $40. It's, uh, it's, uh, it meets on Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can tune in from around the world. As soon as you register, you can watch the first seven hours we recorded. Last Thursday's class was off the hook because last Thursday we dealt with the discovery that came out last Wednesday out of San Diego about a presence of humans that date back, dates back 130,000 years ago, okay, which falls in line with a lot of, of our scholars, like that, Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. I just interviewed him Sunday night. Uh, if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and click on listen to podcasts of the Michael M. Hotep show, you can listen to the podcast of that show. That was a hot show. But we dealt with the evidence showing an African presence in this country going back 130,000 years ago. That was just revealed this past Wednesday, April 26. Okay. Um, so we deal with all this in the course. We deal with archaeological discoveries, all different types of things like this. Right? Yeah, Killer Mike supported bernie sanders but also killer mike said if if uh basically something to the effect of if you don't vote uh things can get worse see the real problem i had he, he supported bernie sanders but now after bernie sanders didn't win now what do you do because this is what i explained to people and and i at one point you know up until recently i was doing radio six days a week i was doing national radio five days a week Okay, and uh, then Palm. I was on the Palmet Radio Network. The Palmet Radio Network's down right now, and I had a daughter, so I have an eight-week-old daughter. So you know, my my hands are kind of full. All right, so I can't I can't broadcast six days a week like I was doing. That wears me out, and there's a lot of research preparing for each one of those shows. So I'm on two days a week on nine ten a.m. The Superstation in Detroit. We broadcast on Facebook Live, but I can't I can't do six days a week, especially six days a week for free, because I gotta that was wearing me out and you know you got you have to do things also to generate revenue as well to stay afloat and you know i have a daughter to take care of as well so um but the online courses i teach through the online courses we do the broadcast on facebook i'm on radio still two days a week so you still get a lot of information all right okay so um i'm gonna post this link here right here right now, this is two articles. I have a ton of articles dealing with the Confederate battle flag, all this stuff. And, and a lot of this information came out in, uh, when in South Carolina in 2015, there was the fight to um, remove the Confederate battle flag after from the state's capital after uh, nine African-Americans were shot and killed by Dylan Roth at Mother Emanuel, Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. OK, but. Um, these a lot of these people don't understand that this confederate battle flag never flew over the confederate states of america because they don't understand history and donald trump their leader donald trump does not understand history either okay we'll come and send me your comments here shortly all right let me get through this information because we're broadcasting through crowdcast through facebook live and i only have two we only have two hours for this broadcasting ends after two hours and i have to get out of here too i have to go see my daughter all right so now, Andrew Jackson in 1832 and 1833 oversaw the nullification crisis in which Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, used the threat of military force to make South Carolina pay tariffs. All right. Now, remember, now, South Carolina is going to be the first state to secede from the Union also. Right. In 1861. Um, OK, the situation was eventually resolved, but is viewed as a precursor to the civil war that small matter aside this actually sounds pretty familiar for donald trump just last week in an interview with reuters okay uh donald trump suggested that there was really no reason for the israelis and the palestinians to have been fighting for all these decades okay so donald trump is is clearly is is clearly clueless about history clueless about history um, in the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, Trump thinks Andrew Jackson, the slave owner with a big heart, could have stopped the Civil War. This is by Kirsten, Kirsten Willis yesterday, May 1st, 2017. In this article, it says, uh, uh, quote, quoted Donald Trump from the interview. He said, people don't realize, you know, the Civil War, you think about it, 
why okay we talked about that he said uh but but by the by the time the civil war erupted in 1861 this is what the article says by the time the civil war erupted in 1861 there was no chance of a reconciliation quote it was much much harder to co compromise as the civil war broke out in 1861 because the nation was more squarely confronting slavery said uh steve uh ins inskeep author of jackson land uh he 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 was uh, interviewed by NPR, National Public Radio, that Donald Trump wants to defund, uh, Monday, May 1st, okay? He said, quote, Northern votes had just elected Abraham Lincoln, a president from an allegedly radical new party that insisted that slavery was wrong and must be contained, and must be contained to the South, must be contained to the South. Because see, with Lincoln, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Don't be confused on this. Lincoln did not, think that slavery should spread to other states. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. And when he became president, there was a fear that he would abolish slavery, but he was not an abolitionist. He felt that slavery should not spread to other states because they tried to keep a balance between free, the number of free states and the number of states that allow slavery. Okay. Now his party was the Republican party. The Republican party was founded by groups of abolitionists in 1854. The Republican Party comes into existence in 1854, founded by groups of abolitionists to be the counter to the Democratic Party, which was Andrew Jackson's party. And um, uh, this was the party of the slaveholders, the plantation owners, the aristocrats, things like this, okay? What's interesting is that now Republicans are trying to do everything they can to put African people back into slavery. Now, Republicans, the Republican Party, founded by groups of abolitionists, now they're trying to do everything they can to put African people back into slavery by any means necessary. Okay, so uh, in this article it says, uh, Northern votes had just elected Abraham Lincoln, a president from an allegedly radical new party that insisted that slavery was wrong and must be contained to the South, not abolished, must be contained to the South. Southerners saw this as a threat to their property and tried to succeed from the Union, okay? People did try desperately to quote unquote work out that problem before the shooting started in 1861. Starts at Fort Sumter in 1861, South Carolina. But it was in the end an irreconcilable difference, end quote. Now, Donald Trump's claim that Jackson had a big heart is also questionable, as Andrew Jackson owned about 150 enslaved Africans. Maybe he, you know, maybe he gave them Sundays off and let them go to church and gave them Christmas off. Maybe he gave them Christmas gifts. You know, maybe he gave them all a new whip for Christmas. <laughs> Quote, although I hate chains, I was compelled to place two of them in irons for safekeeping until an opportunity offers to sell or exchange them, end quote. President Andrew Jackson said of, of recapturing four of the black people he re-enslaved in 1832. So Trump said, you know, he had a big heart, things like this. Well, where did he have a big heart for enslaved African people? And why did he enslave 100, he enslaved 100, 300 over his lifetime, 150 at one point, why was this? But here's another thing. So there was an article yesterday, May 1st, the article, I'm sorry, article from May 1st, 2017. This was updated, May 1st, 2017. Washington Post, okay? We're gonna come and send me your comments in just a minute. Hold, hold on just a second, okay? Because I gotta make sure I get through this information. And, I, and I, I start talking about this, I get excited, okay? I start talking about history, you know me, I get excited. Name of this article is Hunting Down Runaway Slaves. Hunting down runaway slaves, the cruel ads of Andrew Jackson and the master class. The cruel ads of Andrew Jackson, the master class. So this article talks about how Andrew Jackson used to take out ads in newspapers advertising about his runaway slaves so people to, would, would return them to him. Where did he have a heart? Where was it? Well, he had a big heart? Big heart for who? White supremacists? He had a big heart for who? Andrew Jackson urged in an ad placed in the Tennessee Gazette in October 1804, this is before he's president, the ad said, stop the runaway. 
The ads had stopped the runaway. The future president gave a detailed description. The description said, quote, mulatto man slave, mulatto man slave, about 30 years old, six feet and and six feet and one half inch high, stout made and active, talk sensible, stoops in his walk, and has a remarkable large foot. He said a remarkable, did, did he have his foot cut off, cut off like Kunta Kente? He didn't say he has remarkable large feet. He said has a remarkable large foot, which means singular, or maybe one foot was longer than the other. I wonder why. Broad across the root of the toes will pass for a free man. So Andrew Jackson, who would later become president, um, he became the country's, he, uh, in 1829, he became the, uh, the U.S. seventh um, president, okay, under the U.S., under the Constitution. Uh, he promised anyone who captured this quote unquote mulatto man slave a reward of $50 plus reasonable expenses paid. So where is his big heart that Donald Trump's talking about? Donald Trump is clueless, has no understanding of history. Now, Andrew Jackson added a line in the ad that some historians find found particularly cruel. It offered, quote, $10 extra for every hundred lashes any person will give this runaway slave to the amount of 300. Okay, the ad was signed Andrew Jackson near Nashville, state of Tennessee. In the ad, he said that he would give an extra $10 for every hundred lashes any person would give to this runaway slave who's running away trying to get freedom this, the freedom that the Constitution says is supposed to be his, he's running away trying to get freedom. This is after, no, okay, this is, uh, okay, this is in 1804, okay? This is 1804, because in 1808, you all know what happened in 1808. 1808, January 1st, 1808, the importation of African slaves into this country was outlawed because of a 20-year clause, clause in the U.S. Constitution. Now, the institution of slavery is still going to continue and exist, in this country okay but uh because of a 20-year clause in the u.s constitution uh you had uh slavery outlaw okay and um and this is why slave breeding is going to become so popular this is why slave breeding is going to become so popular okay all right now we just posted a link here now i teach a um so we, i teach an online course called ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school and uh the course meets on thursdays is online you can tune in from around the world it meets on thursday 7 p.m to 10 p.m eastern standard time we deal with thousands of years of history we don't we do not start our history in slavery we deal with african people indigenous to north central and south america these were african people they come from africa before then okay we were here in this country at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years ago uh, but there's new evidence that was just revealed April 26, and we talked about that in last Thursday's class. There's new evidence showing an African presence here 130,000 years ago. Uh, we were here before Native Americans came into existence. We were here before Europeans were here. We were here before the slave trade existed. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened. It didn't exactly happen the way Europeans say it happened, okay? But yes, it did happen. Not disrespecting. We can't discount what our ancestors went through. OK, we cannot discount what our ancestors went through. All right. Um, but we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. We deal with um, uh, how the Moors set up Christopher Columbus to set sail on his uh, four voyages starting August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina Independent and Santa Maria. Uh, we deal with a lot of history and how and how Columbus and his four voyages, how this laid the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people, etc. OK, and how um, Columbus and his four voyages opens up the so-called new world to other European nations coming in and um, exploiting these new lands. Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Panama, Honduras, things like this, because you're going to see these different European nations fighting over this land. They're coming out of the dark ages 
the teachings that the Moors take into Europe that come from ancient Kemet, the, the Nile Valley region of Africa, ancient Egypt. We're going to bring them the Europeans out of the Dark Ages. And they're trying to rebuild their respective European countries. And the Portuguese dominate the transatlantic slave trade for the first 200 years, from about 1440 to 1640. And the Spanish are right behind them. So we deal with all this in the course. Uh, it meets on Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we just posted um, the link here. It says register here. You can register for that course if you like. As soon as you register, there's 10 hours of content for you to watch. The first three sessions, uh, session, uh, you can watch those. We have other content for you to watch there. The session we did last Thursday where we dealt with uh, the new discovery of an African presence going back 130,000 years ago, found in San Diego. We deal with, deal with that. And uh, also, there were two discoveries made in Egypt earlier this early, uh, early, uh, earlier in April. One of a um, pyramid from thirteenth from the thirteenth dynasty, and um, the other of uh, eight mummies uh, that were discovered that go back to date back about thirty five hundred years ago. Okay, okay. Ter Tercia said thanks to all that have joined us. Uh, I sent re request to. Okay. All right. Thanks. So you can register for that class. That class is going to totally blow you away. The information we deal with in there. This is just a sample of it because we deal with historical events leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. We do. I deal with history chronologically. I don't deal with the transatlantic slave trade episodically. I deal with it chronologically. Okay. It wasn't an episode in history. Okay. It wasn't an episode in history. Uh, it, 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 it came about because of a sequence of historical events. So we have to understand that sequence of historical events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. All right. Okay. And we're still on uh, Facebook. Okay. So we just posted that link. Let's go to some of your comments here quickly. Okay. And then um, I may do another broadcast on Andrew Jackson. We'll probably talk about this Thursday on uh, Wake Up With Steve Hood, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation. 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation. I'm on every Thursday morning, 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., Wake Up With Steve Hood. Also, check out this other article. Now, it's it, it, a, a, a lot of people speculate that Donald Trump's love affair with Andrew Jackson has been inspired by uh, another white supremacist named Stephen K. Bannon. Stephen K. Bannon, okay? And that's what people think this love affair of uh andrew jackson comes from but in uh march march 16th thinkprogress.org had an article donald trump ties himself to a president remembered for genocide donald trump ties himself to a president remembered for genocide okay and in this article it says trump traveled to tennessee on wednesday to visit the grave of andrew jackson According to the biography on the website for Andrew Jackson's uh, Hermitage, H-E-R-M-I-T-A-G-E, -E, Hermitage. Um, let's see, let's bring this back up here. Okay. President Andrew Jackson fought in the American Revolution at the age of 13 and rose to become a general who helped win the War of 1812. Okay. Uh, President Donald Trump received five draft deferments, including one for bone spurs in his foot and avoided military service. But but Donald Trump did call the sexual encounters of his single years his personal Vietnam, because he said that in the 1970s, he said he tried to avoid getting uh, sexually transmitted diseases was his Vietnam. That was his Vietnam in 1970s. So when Donald Trump became the first president since Ronald Reagan to visit Andrew Jackson's Tennessee home on Wednesday, his attempt to tie himself to the populist but staying legacy of the seventh president was not a totally believable one. Okay, uh, so check out this article also because I don't have time to get into it. We're limited on time here. We'll talk about Andrew Jackson, and Donald Trump some more um, in another broadcast. Okay. All right. 
so let me go to some of your comments. Then I'm going to get into um, an overview of um, this online course that I'm teaching starting up next Monday. Um, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was the war in the African American community, and this ties in to Donald Trump also. Okay. All right. So how'd you all like the information so far? How'd you all like the information so far? Okay, Rio Johnson said 134,000 years, brother. Uh, 130,000 years. Where'd you get 134,000 from? Matisse Ricks said he was Stanley. Stanley Watson said, Big heart, my foot. This is an Indian killer, white supremacist, slave owner. I haven't heard Donald Trump talk about the Indian, Indian Removal Act of 1830. Janelle Strickland said, can you repeat what you just said about the pyramid? So in uh, April 2017, there's a pyramid from the 13th dynasty discovered in uh, Egypt. We talked about that in class um, this past Thursday. Um, but, you know, in 2011, there were seven pyramids discovered buried underneath Egypt. I'm sorry, there are, sorry, there were 17 pyramids discovered buried underneath Egypt in 2011. Because uh, there was a NASA, there's a NASA satellite that's about uh, that's up above the Earth. Um, that's like 430 miles above the Earth, something like that. And it uses infrared technology to see on the ground. And they discovered pyramids buried underneath Egypt. And two of those pyramids were excavated to determine that yes, these are pyramids. Okay. Um, so a lot of these archaeological discoveries that happened in the past few years, we deal with in the course because I deal with a chronology of history. And we deal with archaeological discoveries. We deal with us being indigenous to this land coming from Africa originally, but coming from Africa <laughs> tens of thousands of years before August 20th, 1619. OK, and we deal with the problem with slave movies, things like this. Uh, so we do a lot of that in uh, in the course, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? So if you want more information about that course, you can register for that course. You just posted the link there. Um, as soon as you register, you can start watching content. You can see last Thursday's class that we did. The course is only $40. The course is only $40, the full course. Information is going to totally blow you away. You never look at the transatlantic slave trade again. You won't look at our history the same way again. I deal with the origins of the word Africa, the origins of the word America, the origins of American, all of that stuff in the class. Um, okay, so, and then we, we have numerous references in the course, et cetera, for you also. Did you post a link to the Washington Post article? Don Williams said, which Washington Post article? We, we posted a link uh, uh, to the Washington Post article. If you're talking about the one Trump's totally bizarre claim about avoiding the Civil War, uh, we'll post that link because I think I posted that article yesterday. But um, so you don't have to go back and lower it. Let's see here. We'll post that link right now. Let's go to some more of your comments here. Hold on. Let me pull this up. Okay. Is there a reading list? Let's see. Is there a reading list on your website? I've been clicking around but didn't find anything. Signing up for the course. Yes, there's a reading list on our website. It's under book list. So if you're on your computer, it's at the top of the page. It says book list. We have a recommended reading list of about 60 books. If you're on a if you're on a smartphone looking at it, you have to click. There's a field for a drop down menu. You have to click on that field and then it shows you the book list. Um, so I'm looking at some of your comments here on a smartphone also. So we have Hetty House in the house. Matisse Rick said, do you have any comments on the 15 year old kill by the cop in Dallas? Yeah, they're changing their story. We've been posting articles about that here on our fan page. We'll probably talk about that some tonight. Um, the police are changing their story. We've been posting articles here. Root dot, the root.com has been having some good coverage of it as well. Um, are there pyramids in Ohio? Um, 
there may have been mounds. There were probably mounds in Ohio because see, there were you have um, uh, mounds and pyramid mounds that were all throughout the land we call the United States of America. And these were built by African people, largely built by the Khoisan. There were pyramids up and down the Mississippi River. Um, I just interviewed Dr. David M. Hotep on Sunday. We that's one of the things we talked about. We're gonna get him back on the show probably this Sunday. You can listen to that podcast. Go to um, go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and um, right on the homepage, just click on um, listen to podcasts of the Michael M. Hotep Show. Okay, folks, on link here, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So we have seven hundred podcasted up over seven hundred podcasted episodes of our shows there. Um, so you can listen to that. Okay, and we dealt with the pyramid mounds, all of that stuff. Don Hoppy said, truth crush the earth shall rise again. 2017. Jay Johnson. This is good, brother. B.J. Adams looking to research myself. Where can I start? Well, B.J. Adams, where can you start uh, your research? Um, You can you can start at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can listen to uh, interviews I've done. You can start maybe with the interview I did with Dr. David M. Hotel. We wrote the book, The First Americans for Africans Documented Evidence. Uh, you can start if you want to uh, take the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Um, you can start there also, because we deal with thousands of years of our history. Uh, we give you references, the research, we have uh, articles, video clips, everything. It's a comprehensive course, it's an online course. Uh, courses live 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursdays. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch anything that you miss. You can watch it over and over again. You can read articles that I write also. Uh, African History Network. I actually go to yourblackworld.net, yourblackworld.net. I got to get my I got to get my website up to WordPress that where my articles were because that site costs three hundred dollars a year. And I changed the hosting to bluehost.com and the hosting cost three hundred dollars a year. So when they charge my card, they charge my car, my debit card for three hundred dollars. I thought that was for WordPress. So now I have to pay WordPress another three hundred dollars to uh, get that site back up. So I got to pay six hundred dollars a year um, for the site and the hosting and all that. And I didn't know that. So I haven't been able to do that just yet. Okay, um, here's the article from the Washington Post that Dawn M. Williams, Monica, asked for. We just posted that link. Superstation, is that a site? Uh, 910amsuperstation.com. 910amsuperstation.com. Okay. That's uh, for WFDF 910 AM Superstation in Detroit. That's a real, that's not an online station. That is a terrestrial station. You can listen online, but it's a, a real a real radio station. Okay, Stephanie Tisdale. Hey, Steph, how you doing? Said, thank you, AHN, African History Network. Uh, Try and get some of your comments in here before we continue, if you don't mind. Cheryl Adams said, mulatto at this time in that region refers to native born or Aboriginal Indian, Milano didn't mean black, white until 19, okay, what evidence are you citing that Milano during slavery did not refer to somebody who was a mixed African ancestry and European? What evidence are you citing that that did not refer to that? What evidence are you citing? And if they, if they, were, if they were native born or Aboriginal Indian, and mixed with white, then why were they enslaved in the first place? White until 1920s reclassification of the native born whites. Well, what evidence are you citing that mulatto did not refer to, especially in, in this case right here, this was an enslaved African person. So what are you citing? Okay. Helen X said they just afraid that we're going to turn on them and do to them what they have done to our ancestors and what they're still doing to us today. Okay. 
Uh, many Europeans have that fear. That's not in our nature, but Euro many Europeans have that fear. Okay. Um, Stanley Washington said, is that the guy from, from occult science? Which guy are you referring to from occult science? Teresa M. Palmer said, in the era of a racist 45, because we don't even like to call him by name, Agent Orange, a racist 45 president, presidency, what in your opinion should be the main focus of black people? What do we need to do to secure our children's lives? Well, first thing we need to do is realize how politics impacts every aspect of our life. Maybe not in this order. We have to understand how politics impacts every aspect of our lives. So I'm on the board of Grits and Politics here in Detroit. And this is one of the things that we teach, okay? Because two main ways to understand politics. Number one, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. The legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Number two, politics is the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. The writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. So most of our, many of our people don't understand politics on that level. And we don't understand that when it comes time to vote, your black ass needs to, to, to show up and vote but not vote based upon name recognition. We have to vote based upon the policies, based upon the issues, okay? This is why this, is why this document here is so important. This is one of the things every, every African-American needs to download this document. This is called, We Have a Lot to Lose. We Have a Lot to Lose. Now this is from the Congressional Black Caucus. We Have a Lot to Lose. Solutions to advance black families in the 21st centuries. Solutions to advance black families in the 21st centuries. This is the document that, this is the agenda. There's a 125 page agenda. I downloaded it, took it to the printer, had, it, had them print it up. You can download this from cbchouse.gov, cbchouse.gov, or you can download this from Roland Martin's website. I download this from Roland Martin's website, okay? RolandSMartin.com rollingsmarketing.com okay you download the document we have a lot to lose all right um and they deal they out they, they deal with different issues everything from voting rights criminal justice reform because donald trump had no criminal justice reform program donald trump still does not have a criminal justice reform program because donald trump is not about criminal justice reform hillary clinton had a very good criminal justice reform program most people didn't know it because they didn't go to her website and read the policies this is what they're going based upon perception as opposed to fact this is why i told people some very important things you need to do I told people go to donaldjtrump.com to his his campaign website read his 13 policies that he had up there on his website go to hillaryclinton.com read her 36 policies she had on her website and then you look at the issues you are concerned about and you look and see whose policies are going to best help you, the issues you're concerned about and what we have to understand when we vote for somebody for president we have to understand that it's about the policies, not about the personality or the party. It's about the policies because those policies that they pass impact every aspect of your life. Department of Education, Betsy DeVos, totally clueless about education. She ain't over just, she's not over just public schools. She's over colleges also, Department of Education, because they give funding to colleges. They, they, uh, uh, you, you have a, um, uh, student loans and Pell Grants coming from the public education, okay? Secretary of Commerce, Attorney General, Supreme Court nominees, all this impacts us. Secretary of State, all this impacts us, okay? So there are elements in here that every African-American organization across the country, whether you're a block club, whether you're a Black Lives Matter organization, whether you are a... Uh, uh, a business organization, et cetera, an African-American business organization advocating uh, on behalf of African-American owned businesses like a black chamber of commerce, things like this. The elements that every African-American organization across the country 
can take from here to form a very powerful agenda. And we have to understand, we have to push these agendas at a, at a local, state, and national level. It's not just the presidency. It's pushing these agendas at a local, state, and national level. Okay, this is what this gives you. They talk about voting rights, criminal justice reform, economic justice, education, the workforce, health care, environmental justice. The, the, the rollbacks that Donald Trump is doing with executive orders, rolling back rules that President Obama's EPA put in place are going to disproportionately impact African-Americans. Because when we deal with environmental racism, a lot of the atrocities that take place, illegal dumpings, or, or a lot of these things that take place, the, the emissions, a lot of this takes place in predominantly African-American communities because they care less about those people. So when you start talking about rolling back these things that President Obama put into place, you're talking about disproportionately impacting African-Americans. Okay? So download this document. Once again, we have a lot to lose. This is something people can do today. Download this document. It's free. We have a lot to lose. We have a lot to lose. Solutions to advance black families in the 21st century. Then download this document. This is free also. Indivisible. Indivisible. A practical guide for resisting the Trump agenda. A practical guide for resisting the Trump agenda. Indivisible. Go to indivisibleguide.com indivisibleguide.com okay and um in this document this was put together by you've heard me talk about this before if you listen to my uh if you listen to my shows we'll post a link here indivisibleguide.com tens of thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people actually are organizing all across the country based upon this document when you saw all these white people out here protesting about Donald Trump trying to take away the Obamacare. About Donald Trump. Ma imagine, ima look at how popular Obamacare is now. People don't understand how many white people's lives President Obama saved with Obamacare. People, people do not understand how many white people's lives President Obama saved with Obamacare. People are just starting to realize this. Jimmy Kimmel, and, and I'm not saying Jimmy Kimmel was against President Obama. Jimmy Kimmel just announced last night that his uh, and think progress. I just read an article from I think thinkprogress.org about this. Um, and uh, NBC uh, NBC News has an article also how his how his child uh, got life saving uh, a life saving surgery, and he was able to get health care through Obamacare even though his child had a pre-existing condition and he and, and his and his child was able to get life-saving uh surgery okay this is jimmy kimmel who's on abc who's a multi-millionaire jimmy th th check out this article jimmy kimmel reveals newborn son survived heart surgery jimmy kimmel reveals newborn son survived ha survives heart surgery okay and he talked about how he was able to get health insurance even though his his uh child had this pre-existing condition okay jimmy kimmel used his opening monologue monday night to give an emotional account of how his newborn son was diagnosed with a rare heart condition and almost died during the 13-minute speech jimmy kimmel also gave an impassioned defense of obamacare and criticized president donald trump's failed attempts to cut health spending the 49 year old who also uh, hosted this year's Oscars broke down in tears several times as he opened up about the ordeal before revealing the details he assured the audience it has a happy ending okay uh, so check this out here we'll post this article you can check this out this is uh, this is at uh, uh, I hate it when people send me when they inbox me in a in a mass in a mat in a message with all these other people in it man I, I i hate that stuff okay so check check out that article right there people don't realize how many white people's lives president obama saved 
And if he was a white president, he'd go down as the greatest president in history. If this was a white man that sat all, sat, saved all these white people's lives, saved 1.4 million jobs in the auto industry with the auto bailout that Donald Trump was against, then Donald Trump wants to meet with the, with the CEOs of the big three and beat his chest like he did something great, but you were against the auto bailout that saved General Motors and saved Chrysler. You were against that. Donald Trump said that these companies should file bankruptcy. He said they should move their plants to states that don't have unions and lower their hourly wage and, and, and pay people what they want to, and then people will be forced to take it. This is what Donald Trump said, who, who, who wants to say he's the hero of the working class. Yeah, right. Um, but there's a study that came out that talked about how 30% um, of, um, they talked about like how a third of uh, people who, let me see something here. All right, so, let me stop that ad from playing. All right, uh, there was an article here, I want you to get this one. Yeah, this is it right here. February, see, I have about 10,000, literally about 10,000 articles, uh, and I have a lot of them bookmarked. New York Times, one third don't know Obamacare and Affordable Care Act are the same. OK, this is these are some of the stupid ass people that voted for Donald Trump. Read this article. I don't want you to think I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. I do the research. I ain't making this up. OK, New York Times. February 7th, 2017. This was a study that was done. One third don't know Obamacare and Affordable Care Act are the same thing. When you had the uprising of people saying don't take away the Affordable Care Act, Act, Affordable Care Act and prove it, that's when a lot of people started finding out that they had Obamacare, but um, that they had Obamacare because they had the Affordable Care Act. The other thing is, you have a lot. You have a lot of states like the state of Kentucky, which is one of the states in the Confederacy. In Kentucky, they have Obamacare, but it's not called Obamacare. It's not called the Affordable Care Act. It's called Kentucky Connect. So what happened was you had you have states who actually have the Affordable Care Act, but it's called something differently because these people said they didn't want nothing from President Obama, but they love the health care they have. It's called Kentucky Connect or it's called something else. This is something. And then, and then they found out that they actually have Obamacare from this black man. And they said, don't take away my health care. OK. <laughs> All right. So um, these are some of the things that we deal with in um, the extensive online course that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? Um, that is a, um, that's a seven hour, sorry, that's a 10 hour online course. We may go over 10 hours. So if we go over 10 hours, just be ready. Uh, it's, it's on Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, all the sessions are recorded. So if you missed any of it, you can go back and watch it over and over again. OK, um, we'll post a link here if you want to register for that course. It's only forty dollars for that entire course. As soon as you register, um, there's uh, seven hours of content for you to watch from uh, the classes we recorded. OK, and you'll get to see last Thursday's class where we talked about the discovery made out of um, San Diego of an African presence going back at least uh, uh, 130,000 years ago. In this country we call the united states of america all right so we'll post that link there um vanya edwards well it does does forty dollars include new courses yeah it includes it's it's yeah two, two uh, yeah it includes the, the the courses the sessions taking place this thursday and next thursday also it's the entire course yeah it includes that as well so you'll be able to join the class live uh, Vanya, yes, the the um, it's it's five sessions, two hours each. We have bonus content there for you to view, also. Okay, 
Um, Cheryl Adams said, "Look up Bill signed in May 2016 that Obama signed. What did the bill? What What are the bills about? I mean, there's a lot of bills that he signed. I mean, what are the bills about? Okay, so let's switch gears here because I have to get out of here soon. Um, also teach another course that's starting up next, starting up Monday, May 8th." Monday, May 8th, and it's called uh, How Richard Nixon's War on Drugs was a war in the African-American community, okay? Other thing is, uh, in these courses, I'm doing a, a slide presentation. You get to see the slide show. We have video clips, everything in there, okay? I'm going to show you, um, I'm about to bring up this presentation right here of um, Richard Nixon's War on Drugs, okay? All right, so... Let's see here. Um, let me be, okay, here we go, the split screen. All right. Uh, hold on just one second here. I have to duplicate my screen. Here we go, so you can see this. All right. Okay, Stanley Watson said Dr. David M. Hotep. Okay, now Dr. David M. Hotep is not the occult science guy. He's just somebody else. Rod Jenny saying, can you mention those progressive websites again, Brother Mike? Uh, indivisibleguide.com, indivisibleguide.com. And then also you have um, um, Roland, Roland S. S. Martin.com, Roland S. Martin.com, Roland's website, Roland S. Martin.com. Okay, so let's go to this here. Uh, this is an overview of a four hour uh, online course I teach. It's two consecutive Mondays. We may go a little over four hours, uh, we may go over a little two hours each. Okay, all the sessions are recorded. You watch it anytime. All right, this is a uh, an overview of how Richard Nixon's war on drugs is the war on the African-American community, okay? And in the course, I deal with the origins of the war on drugs. Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs June, 7, June 17, 1971, okay? And I deal with how we've been at war for over 500 years. Um, we can go back to uh, Columbus and his four voyages uh, starting August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina and the Penta in Santa Maria. We see that the war never ended. It didn't end with the end of the Civil War in June of 1865. It didn't end with um, 13th Amendment, ratified December 6th, 1865, uh, adopted December 18th, 1865. Uh, it intensifies December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee with the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. Contrary to popular belief, because I had somebody, I was on Steve Hood's show one Thursday, and some idiot called in and said the Democratic Party created the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, no, he said the Ku Klux Klan created the Democratic Party. That's what he said. He said the Ku Klux Klan created the Democratic Party. No, the Democratic Party is founded about 1828. Ku Klux Klan, they're founded 1865, right after slavery ends. The Ku Klux Klan did not create the Democratic Party. Now, you have some Democrats that created the Ku Klux Klan, but the Ku Klux Klan did not create the Democratic Party. This is why we have to understand the chronology of history. So um, 1971, the war, on, the, uh, the war on African people escalates with Richard Nixon's war on drugs. 1982, we see Ronald Reagan continues the war on drugs. He declares his war on drugs not because crack cocaine became an epidemic, uh, but prior to crack cocaine becoming an epidemic. OK. Um, so. You, you have this, then you have the um, crime bill of uh, 1994 signed the law September 13th, 1994, which a lot of people really don't understand. We deal with that in the courts. A lot of people don't understand the crime bill. First of all, Joe Senator Joe Biden was the chief architect and main sponsor of the crime bill. A lot of people don't understand this. This is why you have to do research. Senator Joe Biden, who became Donald Trump's, uh, became President Obama's vice president. Joe Biden worked on that crime bill for six years. 
Joe Senator Joe Biden was the chief architect and main sponsor of the crime bill that Clinton signed in the office his second year in office of September 13th, 1994, which was designed to be a Southern strategy to win back those uh, Reagan Democrats, win back these white males that uh, were Democrats but voted for Ronald Reagan, okay, uh, in 1980 and uh it's etc et, et right and to show that they could be tough on crime now crime was buck wild crime was out of control in the 1990s we deal with this in the courts it wasn't just out of control in african-american communities or hispanic communities it was out of control in white communities also as well so crime was out of control nobody disagreed with that but 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 what the crime bill did what a lot of people don't understand is that 87 percent of the people who went to prison under two terms of Clinton and went to prison under this crime bill 87 percent they went under state law not federal law okay the crime bill was federal law 13 percent went under federal law 87 percent went under state law why because states had started passing longer harsher sentences in the late 80s and early 90s before the crime bill was signed and this is these are one these are some of the things i did within the course this is why state politics are so important who you vote for governor who you vote for the state legislature because they're putting policies in place at the state level that impact every aspect of your life not only that every 10 years when it comes time when it comes time to redraw the congressional districts in a state who determines how the congressional districts are, redra are redrawn is determined by the state it is determined by the party that's in power in that state legislature so if you sit home and just vote for president don't vote for the state for state representatives and state senate and then when it comes time for allocation for uh state colleges when it comes time for uh drawing redistrict redistricting of the lines when it when it comes time to to vote on issues pertaining to state prisons or other issues pertaining to you in the state and you talk and you look to the president to do something well, wait a second you're dealing with state rights you're dealing with individual governments this is what happens when, when we when we don't understand how politics impacts every aspect of our lives. These are the results. I've done radio shows and I've had a grown adults call in and come to find out they didn't know and they admitted, they admitted it this, they admitted this. They did not know that if you're not registered to vote, you can't sit on the jury. Now, when I say adults admit this, I don't mean adults who are 21, 22, 23 years old. I mean adults old enough to have two or three children, 21, 22, and 23 years old. They admitted that they did not know that if you're not registered to vote, you can't sit on a jury. So we have to understand how politics impacts every aspect of our lives. African history and culture is the foundation, absolutely. African history and culture is the foundation. And it gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. But we have to have a synthesis but between the African history and culture, economic empowerment, and political empowerment, there has to be a synthesis of this. It's not one or the other. There has to be a synthesis of this. Okay. All right. Now, let me bring up the presentation again. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. So these are some of the things we deal with in this course, as well as well as in my course on. Um, Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay. We do we do with this in both courses. And there's a little overlap also, okay? Because as Dr. John Henry Clark taught us, all history is a current event. Everything that ever happens continues to continues to happen in some shape, form, or fashion. There's a there's a little overlap as well, because we're dealing with history and we're dealing with a chronology of history as well. Okay. Um so if you're just tuning in in the beginning, in the first hour, we dealt with uh, Andrew Jackson, slave owner, uh, Indian killer, um, hero of Donald Trump. So we talked with some of the idiotic comments that Donald Trump just made yesterday about uh, 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 seventh president, Andrew Jackson. And then now we're doing an overview 
of an online course that I teach called um, one of the courses I teach uh, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war on the African-American community. OK, and uh, we'll post the um, link in here. Uh, if you want to get more information and register for that course. Now, this course here on Richard Nixon, uh, Richard Nixon's war on drugs. This is um, uh, $15. OK, this course is uh, $15 and it meets on. Uh, uh mondays uh may 8th and 15th okay 7 p.m to 9 p.m eastern standard time all right and uh we'll post this link here okay and i'm going to continue and if you have any questions um you can post your uh, post your questions all right but we deal with um the, the 94 crime bill also because most people totally misunderstand that most people totally misunderstand the 94 crime bill and and i find two things i found found very interesting with this past election cycle two things i found very interesting number one why didn't black lives matter protest against joe biden who actually wrote the crime bill number one they protested against hillary hillary clinton for advocating support for the crime bill okay she ain't vote for the crime bill Joe Biden did vote for the crime bill when he was in the U.S. Senate and he wrote the bill. So why didn't Black Lives Matter protest against Joe Biden? And why didn't Black Lives Matter protest against Bernie Sanders? Because Bernie Sanders voted for the crime bill also when he was in the U.S. Senate I and mean, the U.S. House of Representatives. Bernie Sanders had been in, in Congress for 25 years. He wasn't new. He was new to you. He wasn't new. I've known about Bernie Sanders for years. And I'm not saying and Bernie Sanders is a good guy. He's not a bad guy. He's not a bad guy. Not a lot of his policies didn't make no damn sense. And it was it, he couldn't explain how to pay for a lot of his policies. But Bernie Sanders is a good guy. OK, and he means well. He's from Vermont, one of the widest states in the in the in the union. He started started in the U.S. House of Representatives in 1991. He, he goes to the U.S. Senate in 2007. He voted for the crime bill in 94. Why didn't Black Lives Matter protest against him? If you protest against Hillary Clinton for advocating for the crime bill and she didn't vote for it because she she would she didn't hold office. You got Bernie Sanders running for president who actually voted for the crime bill. Why didn't you protest against him? Now, they protested against him early on for not saying her name and not talking about Black Lives Matter, things like this. They didn't protest against him for not for they didn't protest against him for signing the crime bill. And then why didn't, why did you protest against Joe Biden? because he's the one he was the chief architect and main sponsor of the crime deal and he voted for it also i just find those things i just find those things to be very complex uh you know perplexing i just don't understand that very interesting okay unless maybe what you thought was really wasn't because you didn't do the research unless maybe what you really thought was really wasn't because you didn't do the research this is what we do in this class okay we do what we do with the facts and the evidence now, one of the things I talk about, and I'm going to deal with this in our last session, dealing with um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade. But we see a proliferation of uh, police shootings and videos, not just not just the shooting, but the actual video. Right. And it comes across our, our, our social media feeds uh, on Facebook. We see it on Twitter. We see it on cable news. We see this over and over again. We saw the shooting. Uh, uh, and, and heard the narration from Diamond Reynolds, who was the fiance of Philando Castile, moments after he shot by a police officer. We we see the body of uh, Alton Sterling laying on the ground bleeding. OK, we see the video of Terrence Crutcher being shot and killed by Officer Betty Shelby. OK, in Oklahoma. I think that was Oklahoma. We saw the video of of walter uh uh scott uh shot and killed by uh officer michael sterling okay and uh it was just announced today that he's going to plead guilty in this in the civil lawsuit uh he's going to plead guilty in the civil lawsuit regarding the killing of uh the unjust killing of walter scott well when we see these videos over and over and over again of african people being shot and killed by police 
it has an, an effect on us. OK, now there's a branch of study called epigenetics. There's a branch of study called epigenetics. And if you heard the interview that I did uh, Sunday night with Dr. Shabi Ali, who will be speaking here in Detroit uh, Saturday, May 6, we have the flyer at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Epigenetics is a field of study that deals with how trauma that you experience can alter your DNA and be passed on to future generations. So AtlantaBlackStar.com had an article from September 22nd, 2016. Frequent exposure to shootings of black people can cause post-traumatic stress disorder like trauma. Research says not what they said at the hair salon. This is based upon the data. This is based upon research. Frequent exposure to shootings of black people can cause post-traumatic stress disorder like trauma. Post-traumatic stress disorder like trauma. OK, so in the article, it says disturbing video of police shootings. Disturbing video of police uh, shooting black civilians are simply hard to escape. Once they go viral, that's been the case for most of the recent police shootings caught on tape. OK, with so many images of um, with so many images of. Of, of violence and death permeating the social media space, some people find it necessary to unplug for a while, and I'm one of them, okay, to unplug for a while, because I study this stuff on a daily basis. Mental health experts think that that's not such a bad idea, according to research, frequent exposure to videos and images of black people being shot and killed can have ill, long-lasting effects on black mental health. OK. And OK, so check this. I want to make sure we're still broadcasting here. All right. So let's continue. All right. Now. Uh, Dr. Rachel Yehuda has is a is an expert in the field of epigenetics. OK. And this epigenetics deals with how the trauma, how trauma is encoded in our genes. It alters our DNA. It alters um, a part of our DNA called the F FKBP5 gene. It alters the FKBP5 part of our DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It causes elevated stress, elevated stress hormonal levels. And this altered DNA can be passed on to future generations. OK, so Dr. Rachel Yehuda and her team, they did research on victims of the Jewish Holocaust. OK, and studies done on Jewish Holocaust survivors show trauma is passed down from generation to generation through DNA. Over hundreds, uh, uh, over hundreds of years of slavery is it plausible. Black people have that traumatic experience encoded in their DNA as well. OK, so these are some of the things we deal with in the course, because the war on drugs leads to escalation uh, in the killing of African people. The war on drugs leads to an escalation uh, when it comes to the killing of African people. And the, and the war on drugs is, comes out of white supremacy and racism as well, okay? Now, this is Richard Nixon and John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman was Richard Nixon's domestic policy advisor, okay? Now, Richard Nixon becomes president in 1968, okay? And he ran in uh, 1960. He lost to uh, John F. Kennedy, okay? But he becomes president in 1968. Why? Extremely important. This ties partly into Donald Trump's popularity. Richard Nixon ran on the platform of law and order in 1968. This is why you have to understand history because history has a way of repeating itself. He ran on the pl platform of law and order. And he was running at, uh, on a platform that was a backlash to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. It was a backlash to this progress African-Americans were making. It was a backlash to the Black Panther Party for self-defense, a black pass, a backlash to the black power movement, all of this stuff. OK, he was running on that platform. 
And he said that he was the law and order president. He said he wanted, he said he wanted to be the law and order president. Okay. And this was his platform law and order. Now law and order translates into protecting white people and locking up black people. And it goes back to the original purpose of the modern day police force. Cause the modern day police force comes out of the slave patrols and the night and the night catchers, things like this, that will patrol the back roads, looking for runaway slaves, things like this, protecting white people from, um, um, slave uprisings, things like this. This was the original purpose of the uh of the modern day police department okay now i'm not saying we don't need police today there are some legitimate reasons why we need police today okay but we don't need them to operate based upon white supremacy implicit bias um over policing african americans things like this okay um so richard nixon has a a, a campaign advisor named Roger Ailes, A-I-L-E-S, Roger Ailes. He has a campaign advisor named Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes goes on to found the Fox News Network, the Fox News Network that had Bill O'Reilly on up until last Friday or Friday before last. Sean Hannity, maybe not too much longer. Fox and Friends. Tucker Carlson, all these white supremacists, right? This is Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes just got pushed out of Fox News a few months ago because of sexual harassment lawsuits and Fox News had to pay millions of dollars to file to settle these sexual harassment lawsuits, okay? So Roger Ailes, who was a campaign advisor to Richard Nixon, and Nixon ran on the platform of law and order. Roger Ailes is also good friends with Donald John Trump. And Donald John Trump ran on a platform partly of law and order for his presidential campaign. Ronald, he talked about the silent majority. Well, this ties back into Richard Nixon as well. Richard Nixon, he, he talked about the silent majority as well. OK, so you see a throwback now, Ronald. Now, Donald Trump is a backlash to two terms of the first African-American president, President Barack Obama. He, he, he's a backlash to the Black Lives Matter movement, because if you watch the Fox News Network, you know, the Fox News Network is is, is always attacking Black Lives Matter. Um, he's a backlash to this. He's the backlash to those who want criminal justice reform. He uh, he claims there's a war on police. He doesn't tell you that the majority of the people who shoot and kill police officers each year are white males. Not African-Americans, not Black Lives Matter activists. Majority of police who shoot and kill police officers each year are white males. He doesn't talk about any of this. OK, so Trump wins on, 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 on a, a direct backlash to all of this. OK, now. And let's go ahead. And uh, continue. So I got to wrap this up here in a few minutes. All right. We just posted a link again. This is a uh, this is an overview of um, a class that I teach. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African American community. We deal with all this history and a lot more because you have to understand history to be able to understand the war on drugs. And we go back to the first anti-drug laws, going back to 1875 in uh, California dealing with uh anti-opium laws involving the involving the chinese okay and we deal with the history of marijuana laws all that stuff okay this is what we deal with in the class you have to understand that history to be able to understand richard nixon's war on drugs and and licks and nixon lying uh in front of congress when he speaks to congress okay but in the um in the article from Harper's Magazine, April of 2016. It's called Legalize It All. Legalize It All. Okay. In this article, um, Dan Baum, who wrote the article, he interviews John Ehrlichman, okay, who was Nixon's domestic policy advisor. 
He interviewed him in 1994 and he revealed the findings of that interview in this article talking about le called legalize it all. And he said that Dan Baum told him that the war on drugs was really a war on the anti uh, war movement, the hippies, those against Vietnam, the anti war movement and the African-American community. OK. And, and he said that Dan Baum told him. He said, we knew we could not make it illegal to be against the war or to be black. But he said by associating the anti-war movement with marijuana and associating the African-American community with heroin, he said you could then criminalize them. You could then target their meetings, lock up their leaders, do surveillance in their community, et cetera. OK, he said, did we know that this was a lie? Did we know this was not true? He said, yes, we knew it was not true. But this is what's happening. You have the Vietnam War taking place. And you have a backlash to the advancements that African-Americans made in the 60s with the civil rights movement. And also you have a backlash to the black power movement. All right. So then you're going to have Richard Nixon. Declaring his war on drugs, June 17th, 1971. OK, in front of Congress. All right. Now, um, and it was all based upon a lie. OK, it was all based upon a lie. All right. Now, we also deal with how the media is used to propagate a lot of this nonsense. So think now I've been studying media for 25 years. OK, so a lot of people know I've been studying African history, African-American history, culture, spiritual systems, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship and media for 25 years. My degree is in business administration with a major in marketing. Um, graduate from Wayne State University here in Detroit. And marketing deals with media, ties right into media. So I've been studying media for 25 years and I've been studying the effects of media as well. So there was an article from um, um, thinkprogress.org, thinkprogress.org, okay? And this article deals with how news outlets help convince you that most criminals are black. How news outlets help convince you that most criminals are black. OK. And um, in this article, what, what they, they, they dealt with a study by Media Matters for America, Media Matters for America. This was a nationwide study. They looked at the type of coverage that stories about crime and things like this get okay it, with the with the with the local news stations what they found was that compared to the percentage of crimes they actually commit african americans are grossly over overrepresented on local news broadcasts about criminal activity according to a new report from media matters for america so they gave an example to new york city they said in New York City alone, African-Americans make up 75 percent of criminals discussed on local channels, but they only make up 51 percent of those who are actually arrested. OK, so we're disproportionately. Represented in news stories on the local news channels, OK, that talk about murders and rapes and robberies and things like this We're disproportionately represented there. This plays a big impact on how people. Um. Uh, determine which candidates to support candidates who talk about tough on crime tough on them no we won't no no we don't want to have diversionary programs no we don't want to invest more in schools we want to invest more in prisons this determines who they support for president who who they support for mayor because the mayor appoints the police chief the mayor usually sets the tone for policing in a particular city okay the mayor appoints the police chief okay so this also influences and impacts how people see evidence when they sit on a jury and they see a video of an African-American man being choked and he says 11 times, I can't breathe. 
He's being choked by police, surrounded by police. He's unarmed, okay? And he ends up dying. And the white people on the jury don't think that the police did anything wrong because they're going back to the original purpose of the modern day police department, which was to, which was to protect white people from enslaved African people and, and to be the slave catchers, the night watchers that patrol back roads that also deliver punishment to enslaved African people when they catch them, things like this. They're going back to the original purpose. Now, if you read the document that we talked about, we have a lot to lose, right? From the Congressional Black Caucus. The first thing they do in here on page eight is to lay out African-American history. Before they start talking about the policies, before they start talking about the problems, they, they lay out some of our history to show how we got into this predicament. And I'll just share a section of it with you here, one paragraph. It says, once they arrived in the new world, slaves were auctioned off like cattle. Most slaves were not allowed to read, write, have legal rights to their children or even marry, and they certainly could not vote. In addition, slaves were sold and resold many times, which resulted in the separation of families. Despite all of this, despite all of, wait, hold on, wrong section. Okay, but despite all of this, slaves did form families, even fictive kin, F-I-C-T-I-V, fictive kin, so a fictional uncle, a fictional cousin, a fictional aunt, etc., on the slave plantations to support each other under the crushing weight of their enslavement. In um, here's the paragraph I was looking for. Um, so in addition, black men and women were beaten and whipped into submission. Finally, slave patrols and night watchers, precursors to modern day police departments, were established to control slaves. Now, this is in the document. This is in the agenda from the Congressional Black Caucus that they presented to Donald Trump and, and Vice President Mike Pence and, 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 and many of those in Congress, uh, uh, things like this, because they had multiple. They had um, uh, more than one meeting. This is a document they presented. We have a lot to lose. OK, download this from uh, you can download, download this from Roland Martin's website, Roland S. Martin dot com, Roland S. Martin dot com. OK. Or the Congressional Black Caucus website also. Okay, but you can download this from uh, Roland S. Martin dot com. All right. If you're just tuning in, we're doing an overview of um, we dealt with Andrew Jackson first. Andrew Jackson, slave owner, Indian killer, white supremacist, hero, Donald Trump. We dealt with that in the first hour. Here we're doing. I'm doing an overview of an online class that I teach. Uh, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African American community. Okay. So you can register for this. It's only $15 for this course. It uh it's on Mondays, uh May 1st. I mean, not not May for May 8th and May and May 15th. Okay. And um this deals with the history of the war on drugs, drug laws, things like this, and how to fight against it. And we deal with the change in the way that people are looking at drug addiction and looking at it as a public health issue that needs treatment as opposed to a criminal justice issue that needs incarceration. OK. And we deal with the change that's taking place in how white people started advocating, you know, for the changes in the drug laws. Also, this is extremely, extremely important to understand how white people started advocating for the um, changes in the drug laws. Also. OK, so we'll post the link again. You could register for this um, online course, uh, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. Uh, here. We'll post this again. We'll also post a link. You can register for uh, my course, um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We'll post that link also. Okay. Um, all right. And that course is on Thursdays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The whole set, all the sessions are recorded. If you miss any of it, you can go back and watch it over and over again. Okay. So that, that course runs through, uh, that's this Thursday and next Thursday also. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. All right, let's continue here. 
Okay. So you have this article from Media Matters, the study for Media Matters as well. Very important study. Um, let me fast forward to some of this. We talk about Nancy Reagan's war on drugs. Nancy Reagan's just say no anti-drug campaign. Okay, first of all, her war on, her, her, her um, campaign was a failure. Okay, number one. Okay, um, and it, it, we see it started in 1986. Uh, she goes on the TV show Different Strokes okay to promote the slogan just say no okay but the campaign only succeeded at bringing police officers into classrooms where black and latino kids are far more likely to be arrested at school for these kinds of offenses because this leads to the the, the school to prison pipeline the just say no program just say no campaign leads to the school to prison pipeline now two administrations after president Nick nixon left the White House, Ronald Reagan was elected. His administration carried out, carried on Nixon's war on drugs, but Reagan's campaign was aimed at preventing uh, children from engaging uh, in illegal drug use by using the catchy just say no slogan, okay? Um, now, here's Nancy Reagan on uh, different strokes. I remember when this episode aired, okay? Uh, thinkprogress.org has an article, The Disastrous Legacy of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No Campaign. And what is, is and what is perhaps Nancy Reagan's most well-known cultural co uh, contribution? The first lady stared gravely into the camera and told the American people to just say no. She said, our job is never easy because drug criminals are ingenious. They work every day to plot a new way and bet a new and better way to steal our children's lives just as they've done by developing this new drug crack for, for every door that we close, they open a new door to death. Okay. Okay. And then she says, say yes to your life. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. Okay. But, um, this article talks about how the program was a failure, which it was, uh, decades after first, uh, uh, Nancy Reagan's address to the nation, just say no. Uh, it also became emblematic of her husband's war on drugs. He now he declared his war on drugs in 1982. Rich uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. Okay. Uh, the problem was just saying no to drugs did not actually work. Okay. Now the now the just say no campaign came out of Operation Dare, D A R E, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Okay. And, and Operation Dare was the most widespread educational program operating under the just say no philosophy. OK, and this is essentially going to be a failure at dissuading youth, uh, uh, dissuading young people from doing drugs. They are bought, brought law enforcement officers into classrooms once a week or so to tell young people why they should stay away from drugs. But researchers found researchers found that teenagers who were enrolled in the program were just as likely to use drugs as those who did not receive this training, according to Scientific American, which is a scientific uh, uh, journal, the scientific website, okay, Scientific American. What they found actually worked was when you had training and you had children doing role playing and they're role playing different sides of the argument of why they should not use drugs or why they should use drugs like children role playing playing a drug dealer or friends uh uh using peer pressure to try to convince other friends to do drugs and they're doing they're playing different sides of the uh of those roles they found that that worked better in discouraging children and youth from using drugs than the just say no campaign just say no campaign was a failure okay all right Let's continue here quickly. Okay, so um, we also deal with um, uh, marijuana, why marijuana was made illegal, going back to 1937 and Harry J. Anslinger. Uh, we deal with that as well. Now, and, and also we, we deal with the disproportionate amount of arrests that come from uh, marijuana arrests. So according to the ACLU, nearly half of drug arrests in 2012 were for marijuana, close to 750,000 and almost half of these almost half of those arrests were for possession alone okay almost 4 billion dollars is spent annually on the arrest prosecution and incarceration of marijuana offenders okay and 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 these 
statistics are egregiously skewed according to race. Police in the biggest American cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York arrest blacks for marijuana possession at a rate seven times greater than their arrest for whites, despite the fact that marijuana usage rates do not differ between blacks and whites. So because of white supremacy, implicit bias, African-Americans are more targeted so they have high so they have high arrest rates but there's documented evidence showing that the usage rate of african americans and whites are the same okay and then if you look at the report from uh the department of justice did for baltimore and there was an article from nbc news recently uh they talked about uh uh jeff sessions uh, uh backing out of the baltimore um trying to back out of the baltimore um consent decree it talked about how the uh department of justice report into the investigation of, uh, to the patterns and practices of the baltimore police department the baltimore police department they found that uh white people were more likely to have illegal drugs on them when when they were be stopped uh in traffic stops and search for drugs and things like this but white people were more like li more likely to, to be found with contraband on them okay even though we have the same usage rates for uh marijuana at least now when it comes to white youth white youth are more likely to use hard drugs than african americans more white youth are more likely to use hard drugs than african americans there was a recent study that talked about this What's interesting, when you go back to Richard Nixon's war on drugs, they associated marijuana, which you get a lesser uh, prison term a crime for. They associate marijuana with the uh, anti-war movement with the white hippies, mainly whites. They associated heroin, which you get more time for. They associate heroin with the African-American community, but we were less likely to use heroin than white people were. All right. Uh, so these are some of the things we deal with in the course. We deal with uh, drug laws, how they came into existence, things like this, how people are fighting against it. Uh, the true face of drug abuse studies uh, find white youths are far more likely to abuse hard drugs than than blacks. Uh, our findings add to the growing debate on how the war on drugs has affected African-Americans. We found that African-Americans are less likely than other racial ethnic groups to abuse hard drugs, yet African-Americans are disproportionately incarcerated for drug crimes. Well, this is based upon laws and the enforcement of laws as well, which goes back to politics. This all goes back. This all goes back to understanding politics. And understanding that politics is the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And this all comes out of white supremacy, ties into the media, how the media portrays what a typical criminal looks like, things like this. This all this all this ties together. Okay. So these are these are some of the things we deal with uh, uh, in the course here. Uh, we do it uh, now. This is deep right here. I was up late one night doing some research. And came across I came across a video that led me to this article and I had to pay I had to pay fifteen dollars to get a, a monthly subscription a uh, monthly digital subscription to the New York Times to be able to access this article because this article came out a hundred over a hundred years ago so the New York Times had an article February 8th 1914 okay um, it's called um, uh, Negro cocaine fiends uh, are new Southern menace. Negro cocaine fiends are new Southern menace. Okay. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey prohibition. Negro cocaine. Now, this is a, a huge article in the New York Times. Okay. Um, February 8th, 1914. OK, now this was exactly one year to the date, one year before the movie The Birth of a Nation came out, February 8th, 1915. Name of this article. This came out Sunday, February 8th, 1914, a huge article in the New York Times. Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition.
okay so we have to understand marijuana used to be legal in this country okay marijuana i mean not mar marijuana used to be legal but cocaine used to be legal in this country the reason why cocaine was made illegal was because of who started using it and there were fears that african-american men would rape white women when they were high on cocaine so you started having fears and you started having stories written saying that uh uh police officers now need to have now need to carry a 45 caliber handgun instead of a 38 because a 45 is more powerful than a 38 so to, to, to because a 38 wouldn't stop negroes high on cocaine this is all history this is all history this is why we have to understand this history okay so these are some of the things we deal with in the in the course and a lot more and a lot more okay so once again uh two online courses that you're going to really learn a lot from first of all uh ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school uh that's on thursday 7 p.m to 9 p.m eastern standard time and um that course is only 40 dollars uh, as soon as you register for it uh, you can watch the first three sessions all of us we do it live do the class live is all recorded you can go back and watch anything that you miss last thursday's class was deep because we got into three archaeological discoveries that came out in april including the one of an african presence 130,000 years ago in um discovered in california um and then um also we deal with uh we deal with thousands of years of history in that course and then the other course starts up monday may 8th how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. How Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. That course is only $15. It's May 8th and 15th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we meet live, whole sessions recorded. You can ask questions during the course also with the live chat as well. You can ask questions during the course also. So um, that's how, um, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the african-american community so we're going to post that uh the link to that information here also you can register for both of those and the war on the um uh whoop the one for richard nixon's war on drugs we're going to post some content um there later today you'll be able to watch one of the free pre previews of um of the class we'll post that later today but you can go ahead and register for that um and um also, there's there's bonus content for um, um, the one ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, all right. So we'll go to um, let me see how much time we have here because this broadcast stops. We only have uh, two hours. Okay, this broadcast is about to stop. All right. And then visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a lot of information there, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, all of my DVD lectures are there also, okay? And um, you have all of my DVD lectures there. I have 30 of my lectures on my own. We have a recommended reading list of books also, okay? A recommended reading list of uh, about 60 books there. Uh, we have video clips, uh, a lot of information there for you as well. And you can listen to po audio podcasts of uh, of my radio shows. We have 700 podcasted episodes there also. Matthew Hawkins said, thank you. Priscilla Lewis says, sickening. Uh, she said, thank you also. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, uh, remember, uh, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now is correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Um, I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. Check out the T-shirt. says, I love my history. I love my culture. I love my people. Uh, I love me. Okay, so people like this T-shirt from Power in One, uh, clothing, Power in One clothing. All right, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.